and action. This did your life a lot. It, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it's funny because I never ever expected the lights to take off like they did. And when I started decorating initially, I, I did it out of the fact that it was something to do in the winter time. Yeah. And I helped a friend out who started the Hartford Holiday Light Fantasia. I get this panic call and he says, I'm going to do a Holiday Light Fantasia at Goodwin Park and I have no clue how to set up the power. So can you come over there and give me some direction on what to do? So literally after the, being there for two weeks and, and setting everything up for him and getting him pointed in the right direction, he says, I've got some stuff for you. I said, oh, what do you got? Well, I've got this 15-foot tall gingerbread house and I've got a 10-foot tall stocking and a 10-foot tall angel and a giant candle. And that was the beginning of the South Windsor Holiday Light Festival. Okay. <laughs> what year was that? That was in 1999, because the big problem we ran into was Y2K. It was a situation where getting generators was yeah. very, very difficult, and it was a situation where we had to make do with what we could get, and we had to be very creative on how we powered it up. And now, um, the Channel 3 Kids Camp, they operate the whole deal. Uh, my my friend who started it, he basically donated it to them because he was raising money for them and a profit for himself to a degree. And now they, they operate the entire deal, the uh, Channel 3 Kids Camp. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah, Y2K was funny. Everybody thought the world was going to... You know, that was amazing. All the electrons were going to end. My, my job before and outside of politics was at the Metropolitan District, MDC in Hartford. And I started as a junior electronic technician and I worked my way up, something you probably could never do today. But I worked my way up, became the supervisor in charge of the electronic maintenance and then facilities and electrical maintenance. And at the end of my career there, I was in charge of the facilities in the Hartford area. I was the key holder for the life health safety, the alarm systems, for the fire department, for all that, that good stuff. But the point being, back during Y2K, quietly I did some testing on some of our computer systems and forced them ahead and no problem, none whatsoever. Nothing stopped working. And I said to my boss, I said, you know, Jack, we're not really going to have any problem here. Well, how do you know? I said, I already did testing. You did testing? You didn't tell me? <laughs> I said, well, you know, um, I didn't tell you because you'd say no. Oh, all right, so what were the results? And I told him, nothing happened. No problems, no shutdowns, no failures, no nothing. And it was a very boring night. Yeah because I, we had the entire maintenance crew in just in case. Yeah. We would have a situation where there would be all these different failures, and there were no failures. The computerized alarm system worked fine. The computerized reporting system in the field at all the pump stations for water and sewer, they, they were no problem whatsoever. Um, nothing was uh, out of the ordinary, and some folks made a lot of money. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they sold new systems, they sold new computer programs, they they sold updated software. You know, that was one of those deals where you got to say to yourself, was there a concerted effort to get folks to either upgrade or just to get folks to buy the products and the services? Well, you know, so that they could make money. I mean, fear sells. Yeah. Fear sells, you know, not just for us, but I mean, for the companies that were offering the services saying, yeah. hey, you know, we're going to go through your system. We'll update all your software. Well, and the generators be... were sold. Everybody bought stuff preparing for everything to shut down out of fear. It was 
Yeah, the unknown. Fear based, unknown. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it it was amazing. I can remember being in meetings where they were talking about, well, you know, jet aircraft shouldn't be flying. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what 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 would it, because the date changes from nineteen ninety nine to two thousand, airplanes are gonna fall out of the sky. Yeah. You know <laughs> You didn't know. But there were really people that thought that. Yeah. You know, a little common sense would have gone a long way. An awful long way. But a little common sense always goes a long way. It's you know, funny how that works. When, when you've got folks that are promoting disaster, yeah, that are talking it up, that are saying all these things could conceivably fail. I mean, they, there were folks talking about the electrical system. The mm -hmm. Northeast Util At that time, Northeast Utilities would not be able to provide power. And you're right. That's why people were buying generators or renting generators or leasing generators. You know, it's it's a case where there was no common sense. Yeah, well, people buy ridiculous shit when they're scared. Look at the toilet paper thing <laughs> that happened with COVID. Oh, I know. Like, why was why was toilet paper so valuable to people in right. that scenario? Yeah, that that was an amazing deal there. It's just fear. The sales. The, the panic level. The misinformation, um, common sense that was not utilized. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to minimize COVID because there were a lot of folks that came down no, with it. it. I don't but, think it's about minimizing it. I think it's about there's hindsight. It's right. always 2020. And, and, and there's the idea of having an understanding of, okay, we don't know what's going on, but let's not project fear into it. Let's project common sense and understanding of like, okay, if you're at risk, if you feel like you're at higher risk, this is what you should do. And if somebody said, oh, we have this theory that if everybody wears a mask, it's going to, it's going to work and it's going to help. Okay, great. Then let's all just wear a mask, right? Like there's nothing wrong yep. with saying, okay, this is a simple thing that seems like if it's going to work, it's going to work. But as soon as they did the research and they found out it wasn't working, then you just go, okay, that doesn't work. So great. Or it has very little effect on X, Y, or Z. And it's interesting to note that what out in California they're already talking about, they want folks to mask up. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, I think Kathy Hochul might have talked about it in New York. I'm not entirely sure there. So now we're going back to some of the things that, quite frankly, didn't work. Right. But gave a false sense of security because you're doing something. And it seems like it's going to be solving a problem. A lot of it goes back to common sense. You know, um, if you're vulnerable, then you need to take pro precautions. Yeah. Um, I've gotten it two, maybe three times already. And each time, well, the first time I had a horrible cough for like three days and then I had the flu. What, what appeared to be the flu to me. Yep. The second and third time I got it, it was just a fatiguing situation. It was worse than a bad cold, but not quite a, as bad as the flu. And I was, you know, I took precautions. How early on did you get it? March 2020. Okay, so you got it early. Yeah. Before the vaccine was available. Yeah, right, right. Did you get, you had to, because you're a state rep, or you didn't have to get so vaccinated? What what happened there was the vaccine wasn't available. There, right. there was no vaccine at that point, right. March 2020. But we had all these public hearings, one after another, and there were literally thousands of people in the legislative office building. And I love to talk to people. And I talked to so many people about, you know, these different public hearings and, and got their take on things. Because a lot of times that I've learned... You can ask questions when you're in the hearing room and somebody might be afraid to tell you what they really, really think when you ask a really hard probing question. Yep. So when you talk to them outside of the hearing room and you ask them a very difficult, a very tough question, something that they might not want to do, say, in front of the TV camera, because there's cameras in most of the hearing rooms, so you would get the answer. And when we went to Zoom meetings, 
you lost that. Yep. Zoom meetings. I understand folks that don't want to come to the legislative office building, and I respect that. Sure. But you lose something, especially, let's say you came to a public hearing that we were having on podcasts. You know, we want to, you know, ban podcasts. Yep. So you might not want to say that's the craziest thing you've ever heard and what's wrong with you guys because it's the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Yep. So you would make a comment, and I'd say to myself, there's more to what he's thinking and saying than meets the eye. So I would follow you out of the hearing room, and I'd say, okay, you said this, this, and this. Tell me a little bit more about what you think. And then you'd unload. You're not in front of a camera. You're not in front of a bunch of people. Yet, I take back information from you, yep. and I share it with my colleagues up there in the legislature, and I say, you know, this is what I heard from somebody outside of the, you know, outside of the, the hearing room. He really didn't want to say this in front of everybody, but we need to consider this. And that happens an awful lot. I bet. Now, I've got to tell you, it was really encouraging because we've had our committee meetings for organizational purposes, to see people in the hearing room from the outside. You know, a lot of them are lobbyists, yes, but there's also ordinary people. Yeah. And to see people in the hearing room and know that you have that opportunity to talk to them away from the cameras and say, what, you know, What's really the issue here? And they'll tell you. That's very important. That really is. And that was the one thing we were missing when we went to just plain Zoom meetings and not having people in the building. I also can, can appreciate with the Zoom meetings, you know, somebody might live down in Greenwich and they don't want to drive up to Hartford to testify. And they don't want to just, subs you know, send in testimony, written testimony. So the Zoom, for that purpose, makes sense. It does, because... Well, technology should make our lives easier and smoother, not be a crutch. Correct. Easier and smoother, but not the end-all and be-all, because if there's something wrong with the technology, then you find out later that there's a real right. issue there. Kind of like with the with the problems we had with COVID. You know, certain things would work, certain things wouldn't. Right. You know, when everybody was using hand sanitizer. Right. And it turned out to be that COVID wasn't transmitted through that. It was transmitted basically if you coughed on someone, you sneezed on somebody, you know, like with the flu. Right. You know, but, you know, getting back to, to the legislative process, having those people in the room having people that you can actually talk to and and drill down and find out what the issues are on on a proposed bill makes so much sense yeah. and and really aids the process of understanding what the real causes and effects and the issues are and what i always like to refer to as unintended consequences and that's a big thing um my background prior to being in the legislature was on the uh, South Windsor Town Council. Uh, I was a deputy mayor at one point for a term, and I had two terms as mayor. And I always considered that the unintended consequence of, of doing something. You know, how many folks are going to have a negative impact on if you were to put lights at a field? How many people would love to have the lights at the field? And, yeah, why and, don't we have lights on the field? That frustrates me. I <laughs> l let me tell you, it it has been a daunting situation. It really has. I I know at one point in time there was a proposal. I think we've had a couple of referendums that have failed to put lights on the field. I've got to tell you, the high school field is gorgeous. It is. 
Yeah. And I think it's insane that it doesn't have lights. Yep. Like, why is it a problem to have a football game or a soccer game or something until 9 o'clock at night? Yeah. Isn't there a town ordinance on sound and volume in, that's later than 9 o'clock? Because, well, what you've got, I don't know if you've ever um, seen the, the I have two baseball I field. High school. The baseball fields. Yep. And they, they have games. And I want to say after 9 o'clock, they, they turn the volume down. Sure. Which is understandable. I think there needs to be more dialogue with the neighbors. You know, yeah. Because we, we put up substantial fencing to try to block and mitigate the impact on their quality of life. That's something that we did well back when I was mayor. We we put up that, that sound barrier there. You probably have seen yeah, I've it. I've seen it. Yep. And it's helped. And I think if we engage, and, and again, this would be local leaders although I'd be more than happy to, to, to sit in. But like if the town council engaged with these folks and saw if there was a way they could work out some kind of a deal to, to make it more amenable to them, yet allow the town to be able to do it, maybe even you try having a game with uh, light towers because you yeah. can rent light towers. Right. And, like and that's see- a homecoming game with light towers. Yeah. Just to give it a test to yeah. see what the impact actually would be. But it's very rare for a high school football game to run past nine o'clock at night. I um I concur on that. You know, it's um I don't know if you've been over to Rye Street where they have the lights and they have the football games. Uh huh. And I I'll tell you, I had a great time going there. Going to watch the Panthers play. Yep. And that 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 group let me tell you, some of those kids, they are really, really great athletes, and they've got a, a bright future. And they've got the the sound system there, and they've got it basically toned down, you know, enough where you, you hear it around the field. Yeah. And you've got the lights there, and I'll tell you, it's a great experience. It, well, that's the thing, really right? Is. Like, it's, it's a community experience. Yep. To be able to go to a football game or a soccer game or whatever game it is under the lights on a weekend night. I mean, there are towns in this country that literally shut down just for football games on the weekend so the community can be together and watch the kids play. Friday night lights. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All so that. That might be something the town council could do. They could say, hey, you know, we want to p- use light towers for a game. And then get your feedback on how it worked out. I think that would be a good exercise. Uh, it would be something that would be interesting to see how the uh, the residents there reacted. Yeah. And basically, it's like taking a temperature, mm-hmm. seeing how it would work out. Now, you said you've got, what, a couple of kids in the sports? Yeah, we got two girls. Two girls? In high school, both freshmen this year. Great. Uh, one plays field hockey and softball, and I think she did indoor track this year, and then the other one plays volleyball and softball. Good deal. So, Good deal. Before COVID, I had um, I had the pleasure of attending a wrestling, the huge, yeah. r- huge wrestling match they had on a Sunday. Uh, my my neighbors, the Odells, yep. uh, Skip, God bless him, he, he passed on, and, and Gail, the three kids, Max, Sam, and Jake, my godson Jake, they all were wrestlers. I wrestled in high school. Then over here in Rockville. Good deal. Well, Rockville was always the arch uh, arch Gosh, enemy in the South Let, let, let Not me tell you more. But back then, oh man, you know it's hard to go root for South Windsor. Right? <laughs> I, I, I was I was class of seventy four. Yeah. And you didn't want to be anywhere near Hardy's when there no. was the South Windsor Rockville football game nope <laughs> that, that was like no man's land so getting back to the to my neighbors and my godson the sports activities that they did in wrestling and to a lesser degree football actually paid substantial dividends um, Sam he was able to get an appointment to the Naval Academy and and currently he's a first lieutenant United yeah. States Marine Corps and he's due for a promotion to captain, and that should be occurring in the next few months. Uh, Jake, my godson, 
he was also great in wrestling. And he got a full boat scholarship. Uh, he's an engineer over at Pratt and Whitney. And Max, he just graduated college. He, he took a break. He graduated college. And again, he got a scholarship for his activities wrestling. So team sports and sports of that type build rugged individualism, build a team ethic, the ability to work with people, and these young folks can actually get scholarships and get full boat college degrees. I, I get into this a lot, especially on my TikTok now, is we get into it a lot with people that don't understand the life lessons behind sports in general, right? So we literally just went viral this week with a clip I had about making my daughter run after practice because she didn't put the effort in during the game or during the practice. And I'm getting flack for that because, oh, that's, you know, that's borderline abuse or that's this or it's, or it's, you know, you're, a, you're an overbearing dad and you're living through her, you're living your dreams through her. And it's, you're missing the point that she didn't put the effort in. If I asked her to do the dishes and she just ran them underwater and put them on the counter dirty and said they were done, should I do them for her and appreciate the fact that she put lackluster effort into it, but she at least did something, so good for her? Or should I call her back into the room and make her do it correctly and then educate her on how to do it properly? Right. Right? Yep. That, and that, to me, is the lesson that she learns in, football, in, in sports, whether it be whatever sport she's in. But if you are in practice and you're not putting in the effort and you're not being a member of the team and putting in the work during practice or in your games, then you have to be held accountable afterwards. It's no different than in school when you get a detention for breaking the rules. It's no different than getting a zero on your test if you don't answer the questions. You, you should get another opportunity to take the test if you failed it, sure. But that doesn't mean the teacher should sit next to you and give you all the answers. That means you should go back, study, and take the test again. I'm all for second chances. What I'm not for is not holding people accountable and not teaching youngsters that you have to learn how to be effective and accountable in every scenario. And sports are an amazing vehicle to do that. It's one of the rare opportunities you have to have fun and do work at the same time. And the physical activity, you know, there's been a lot of talk about young people being out of shape, out of condition, having various health maladies. Mm -hmm. The exercise, the mental acuity that you have in sports, and when you think about, and when I talk about the three Odell kids, how sports actually help them win scholarships, yeah, and they got tremendous educations, and the, the three of them, you know, think about it. U.S. Naval Academy for one of them, engineer Pratt & Whitney for the other one, gra college graduate for the other. That wouldn't have occurred if they hadn't been in wrestling and to a lesser degree in football. Right. And, and that made such a difference for them and having parents that encouraged them to do the right thing, to train. And, and when I think back years ago when the kids would be getting ready for a wrestling match and I would see them in the morning when I would be going to work about, you know, like 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, and I would see one of the kids out there running mm -hmm. with a very heavy suit on. And I asked him one day, I said, gee, you know, I, I was going to work and you're out there running and you're really dressed, basically overdressed. And the comment was, well, I'm, I'm working to get my weight down just so that I can get in a, a better bracket for my ability. And I said, wow, you're really dedicated to this. And when I saw some of the medals and trophies and things of that nature that they won over the years, and basically the three of them 
getting full boat scholarships, one of them a commissioned Marine Corps officer. And, you know, it, it, it says a lot about how sports can help you out as you grow. Yeah. And mature. Absolutely. And, you know, it was like, like in my case, I didn't play sports, but my mom, dad, first thing they said was, when I turned 16, is you got to get a part-time job. Mm-hmm. Right off the bat. That was a rite of passage. And I, I had worked on the farm to a lesser degree when I was younger, Krosky Farm on Foster Street. And... I got a part-time job. I was working as a janitor, and and it was funny because I I go back to my days when I was working as a janitor when I was going to school, and then I become the, for lack of a better term, supervisor manager of maintenance in the headquarters building at the MDC, and I'm conducting a uh, pre-bid conference for janitorial contract. And the first thing I said was, you know, when I was a kid, I worked as a janitor, and that was one of the most rewarding jobs I ever had, because I would go in there at night, the place would look awful, would be a mess, I'd clean the place up, and at the end of the night, I would see the fruits of my labor. Yep. The place would be clean, the owner of the company was always happy, and when I reached the point where... I had other pursuits, and I and I couldn't work part time. I, I said to him, "I said, well, I'm I'm leaving," and it was like, "Really? You're 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 leaving?" And they were always happy with the way things were. You know, it's a function of whatever you do in life. Do the best you can. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's and that somebody commented today. Why isn't it okay to just be mediocre at the stuff that we do? It's not that it's not okay to be mediocre. It's just that if mediocre is your peak, then that's fine. That like that is fine as long as that's the top level of your effort. But if you're being mediocre to accept the fact that you don't want to put in all of the effort as everybody else, that's a different statement altogether. You don't have to be an all-star athlete. You don't have to be the best mathematician. You don't have to be the best thing in the world at everything you do. You just have to be the best version of you. That's the point. So in sports can help that. And I don't want to take anything away from other activities. Theater can do that for people because anything where you can work in a group with other people and come to a common goal and achieve that goal together creates amazing life skills that are necessary. Right? You know, that's that's interesting you say that because getting into politics, when I was on the town council, I, I learned the lesson of working with eight other people. Mm-hmm. Because if you want to get something done, believe it or not, whether you're in the majority or the minority, you can get things done. I went to the legislature, and one of the things that I'm very proud of is what we were able to do for the folks with the crumbling foundations. I don't know if you know anyone that in South Windsor that has a crumbling foundation. I know people in Tolland. I don't know anybody in South Windsor. Well, there's quite a few people in South Windsor. Is there? That makes sense. Yep, yep. Literally just up Felt Road, there were a couple of houses that were lifted and repaired. And we as a legislature worked on the issue in a totally bipartisan manner. You know, the pyrotite, which causes the foundations to fail, it doesn't care whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, or unaffiliated. No. All it wants to do is ruin your home and basically destroy your life. Right. So we worked totally together in a bipartisan way. We have, and I'm the Republican chair of the Crumbling Foundation Caucus for the House. Uh, We have a Republican chair for the Senate. We have a Democratic chair for the House and a Democratic chair for the Senate. And we all work together with the same common goal of doing anything and everything we can do 
to help these folks out and to come up with a solution so that we don't ever have this problem again. And we, we met, literally, we met about two weeks ago on some new information pertaining to some of the problems with the fact that some of the, and I'm going to use the term aggregate that goes into the concrete, some of the rocks that, that go into the concrete that are going into homes are coming from basically crushed concrete. And now there's the possibility of having that pyrotite issue go into new homes. So we've got something. I know there's going to be a bill that's going to be talking about not allowing the old concrete to go into a residential home as aggregate, and it has to be fresh material from a quarry. Now, I realize I'm building the watch here, and it's probably more information than anyone right. wants to know. But the point being, we are staying on top of the issue. We've gotten over 600 homes repaired, and people are living back in them, and their lives are put back together. Because you think about it, what's, what's the biggest investment in life? Your home. Yeah. Right? And I've got to tell you, one of the toughest days for me as mayor was I, I get a call from the, the clerk of the council, and, and she says to me, she says, um, I've got a, a family that would like to meet with you about the crumbling foundation issue. And I said, okay, I'll, uh, can, they, can they meet at 4 o'clock? And it was like, yep, certainly. So I see the couple when I go into the caucus room, and I know that they, they have a son who has some challenges, and the house is going to basically be the fund to finance his care when they're gone. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is tough. So... Like I said to them, I said, we're going to work on this issue. We're going to do something. We're going to get it done. And we're going to come up with some way that you can put your life back together and you won't have to worry about your son when you're, you're gone. And we did it. It's awesome. We did it. That, I have to tell you, from a personal standpoint, that to me was one of the most rewarding things I have done in my entire time in, in politics and, and my career in politics is... Why did you decide to get into politics? You know, it's funny. Um, 1992, yeah, 92, 93, 92, I got appointed to the Wetlands Commission. Um, I had a friend that encouraged me, said, Tom, you'd be good on this. I said, okay. So I got appointed to the Wetlands Commission, and then, then there was a, a deal with Wapping School in 93. And I went to a number of meetings, voiced my opinion, had my say, and a friend of mine, um, Kevin, Kevin Rennie, he said to me, he said, oh, Kevin Rennie. he said, Tom, you're very opinionated. You should run for office in <laughs> And I said, really, Kevin? He said, yes. So, 1993, I ran for Board of Ed. I served on there for one term. And then I went to the town council. And from 1995 to 2007, I served continuously. 2007, I want to say I was deputy mayor at that time. And I needed to take a break. You know, it... Because serving on the town council can be like a job in some fashion, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, you're trying to solve problems for people. You're passing budgets, uh, the same kind of stuff that we do up at the legislature. Um, it's a in some fashion, it's a lot easier at the local level because you're only dealing with nine people on the town council versus 151 in the House and, you know, 36 in the Senate. So I, I took one term off. And I'm watching what's going on on the town council. And I said to myself, I got to get back on. So in 2009, 
I ran. I was top vote getter. And it was interesting because the party that has the most seats on the council chooses the mayor. So the other side of the aisle, they had more folks on the council. And I may have been the top vote getter, but they chose their, their guy as the mayor. And the next time around, I became mayor. And I, I have to tell you, it, it's almost like almost like a Frank Capra movie. I, I always dreamed of being the mayor of the town of South Windsor. And I, I was blessed. I had two, two opportunities to serve as mayor. And then Bill Amon, good friend of mine, state rep, yeah, he was retiring. And you, you talk about the stars lining up. And that was in 2016. The MDC had an incentive for folks to retire. I had my 32 years in for the full retirement. And I was the beneficiary of the sweetener they had for folks to retire. So I ran for the office. I won. I got elected. Went to the legislature, worked on the crumbling foundation issue, and I continue to have fun up there solving problems and working with people. And when I say working with people, I like to work with folks on both sides of the aisle. One thing I've always tried to do is make friends with as many people as I can. Because if you're friendly with somebody, you're more apt to A, work with them, B, be able to work with them, and C, never say anything that you'll re regret. And, and building up those, those kind of friendships and alliances to get things done to benefit your community is one of the most rewarding things to do. And we've gotten some good things done, whether, whether it be a low-income banking system that we have now or the crumbling foundation issue or the funding for it. Uh, we've done good things. That's great. And I, I look forward to continuing to do great things. So when you work, so you're a town representative. State representative. State representative yep. for the town. Yep, for the 14th district. So who's in the 14th district? Okay, 14th district is only South Windsor. Okay. I'm fortunate. There, There's folks that have like five or six towns. Right. Um, in the case of South Windsor, there's a piece of South Windsor that's actually part of the 5th District in Windsor. Okay. So you've got a continuity between South Windsor and Windsor based on the fact that you have the bridge there. So you represent your town on a state level. Correct. Correct. So what are, you, so what are some of the things that come up on a state level that would affect your town that you have to step in for? Well, how about building a new school and making sure that there's the state funding so that you, you may or may not know, but there's funding that comes from the state of Connecticut for new schools in addition to whatever is bonded by the town. Every school in town has been the beneficiary of the state funding. And you basically have to get it into the bonding bill and get support for it. So that, that's one aspect right there. Educational cost sharing. The money that comes from the state of Connecticut reduces the tax burden, the property tax burden on you and me when it comes to pay for the education in the town of South Windsor. And it's over, it's, I want to say it's about $11.8 million in, in money that comes from the state of Connecticut. So that's just a couple of issues right there. Um, issues pertaining to, to streets and the roadways. And I know that we're going to be getting some money 
to help in the the odor issue from the South Windsor treatment plant. Okay, things things of that nature. Um, and and any law that's passed in the state of Connecticut that would be beneficial for the town. So it's not a law gets passed and it's not mutually exclusive. Well, there are some, but by and large, the laws are not mutually exclusive to just one town or another. But that's a couple of examples right there. Yeah. You know, the, the educational. So thing. how many representatives are there from each district? Okay. A district would have a state representative in the House and a senator in the Senate. Now, like in the case of South Windsor, I've got probably three, two-thirds, three-quarters of South Windsor. The state senator that represents South Windsor has South Windsor, East Hartford, a portion of Ellington, and a portion of East Windsor. It's a much larger populace that a state senator would, would work for. It's roughly around 90,000 or so versus 25, 26,000 for a state representative. I'm very happy being a state representative because it, it allows me to work for and with the same people I worked for and with when I was on the town council, except for that little portion of South Windsor that's in the 5th District. And a lot of those folks will, will call me anyway and ask if I can help them out because they're so used to dealing with me. Sure. But, um, no, it, it, that's how it's divided out. And I, I know there's at least one representative who's got like five or six towns in the northeastern part of the state of Connecticut. Okay. Because they're all very low population towns. Yeah. But large in area. Correct. Correct. Yep. Doug Doug Dubitsky's got um he's got a number of towns there and quite a few of them well they're all rural. Very very rural. Probably like what South Windsor was back when I was a a kid. Okay. Because South Windsor, you know, if you go way back, it was very it was a really agrarian town. You know, you had a lot of farms here. Yep. And you had the the tobacco plantation there in Manchester. And I know you had the Lithuanian and Polish contingent of farmers here. And I want to say probably in the 50s, we were somewhere around 8,000 people. And and now we're like, what, 27, 28,000. And you've lived in South Windsor your whole life. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. So born, raised, stayed there. But, Are you married, have kids? Um. Married, yes. Kids, no. Okay. That, that's probably my one regret. Not having kids? Yep. Why? Well, from the standpoint of who do I pass the farm on to or the property on to? I can be adopted. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got to change your name to Del Nicky. Don. <laughs> um, yeah, no, because I, I, I understand that, and I... So I'm married. I adopted my niece. Wow, that's great. When she was two and a half. She's 14 now. We just got married this past summer, but we've been together for six years now. Yep. She has a daughter that's 14 also. And then she has her son who's now 21. Wow. So I always said, because I come from a family of seven where six of my siblings are adopted. So when I adopted my niece, I made the very conscious decision, I do not want biological children. Because growing up in that scenario as the one biological child of seven, I never wanted to have any resentment in my, in my family for being the one biological of... My parents were very good at loving all of us equally and treating us all the same, in my opinion, which for me... As a kid, without any real thought to it, it was like, well, I'm biological. And I never really overthought it, and I never... There was a time in my in my later teens where it became something that I thought about as they were all having struggles and doing things, and I was 
aggravated with them and they still, my parents still love them the same. And I was like, well, how is that reasonable and logical? And I get it now. Like you don't, you, you still love the human beings that you love and that's a thing. But back then and when I was in that younger years, I was like, well, they're not only are they being pieces of shit, but they're also not even related to you. Like they're, they're not your blood. And I'm Italian American and I'm, and my dad's French and Irish and family meant a lot, even though we weren't connected to ours really well, but it was always blood is thicker than water. And, and this is your family and you have to protect your family. And it doesn't matter what other people say, your family matters. And then as I grew up and I got older, that dissipated because I became a person who believed that it didn't matter if you were related, if you were a piece of shit, you were a piece of shit and you didn't belong in my life. Right. So I've made that very clear distinction of if you're going to make poor choices, you're not going to be in my life. So when I adopted my niece, I made that very clear decision. I don't want to have biological children because I don't know that I'm capable of separating, of not separating the two people. I'm not, I don't know that I'm capable of, of not loving something that came from me as much as something that came to me. And I love my daughter with all my heart. I, she is my person. I love that kid. I, I, she has changed my life for the better in so many ways that it's really even hard to explain how many ways she's made my life better. Um, but in that, I totally understand the regret that might come in my later years of, well, I never went through that process of having a kid, never went through that process of my wife being pregnant or my girlfriend being pregnant and being there for them and then the baby coming and being born and it being connected to me and it being truly connected to me as a as a being. Like my DNA is there, which you can argue that DNA doesn't matter, but, and I don't have any siblings that are mine that are blood related. I only have the siblings that I have. So the only biological connected people that I have are my parents and aunts and uncles and cousins that I never really was that connected to or that involved with. So it always became this very complex, controversial thing that I thought about constantly of, I don't want to have, and I'm lucky because my wife doesn't want any more kids, so it never came up as a conversation or, or a thing to need or want more kids. We both were on the same page with that when we got together. But I'm very curious as to what it'll be like as I get older, if that regret will settle in. You know, it's interesting that you say that and you talk about being adopted. Um, I was adopted by my grandparents. Okay. Okay. Um, my mom and dad, biological mom and dad, broke broke up shortly after I was born. And um, I was blessed because... I basically received a lot of old school teachings, you know, hard work. You know, I, I talk about my mom saying, oh, you got to get a part-time job. Yeah. Or my dad saying, well, you should go to work on Krosky's farm. You know, that kind of thought process that you you wouldn't get today, typically. And one of the... Um, and my heritage is uh, is Lithuanian Polish. My my dad, my biological grandfather, he was actually born in Vilnius, Lithuania. Okay. Right on his birth certificate, God bless his soul. Uh, that is uh, is something quite unique, and it's interesting. There was up until two years ago. If you wanted to get your original birth certificate, you would have to go before a probate court judge to get your original birth certificate if you didn't know who your original biological parents were. Right. And you want to say you wanted to know it. It was actually protected information that you couldn't have unless you went to court to get it. And one of the things that, that we were able to accomplish there 
was to get those documents opened so that if somebody wanted to see their original birth certificate, they could. And that was a real challenge. And that was one of the things that we fought long and hard about to, to get that document unsealed. And, and it was interesting because that's where I know about the Polish connection on my heritage. Yeah. Is the original birth certificate and the name on it. And it was pretty obvious it was Polish. Yep. So that, that's something that you can bear in mind if yeah. you wanted to get your original birth certificate. So did you know, when did you get adopted and how long and when did you find out that you were adopted? I was, I found out when I was 12 years old. And when, how old were you when you were adopted? Uh, less than a year. Less than a year old? Yeah. Yep. By my grandparents. How did you find out? How did I find out? My, uh, my mom, my biological grandmother, I'll never forget this day, sat me down and said, I want to tell you something. And she basically told me the whole story. And I'll never forget the day. It was a cloudy day. The conversation was in the dining room. And I can remember the chair I was sitting in. You know, it's one of those moments in life that you never forget. Yeah. And that was quite a few years ago. And I, my, my takeaway there was, Wow, they loved me that much. It's a great takeaway. Yeah. You know, and and my my one regret in life is they never saw me become mayor and they never saw me become state representative. But I'd like to think and I and I and I hope and pray that they did see it and that God facilitated that. Yeah, that would be nice. Because the life's lessons that that they gave me, hard work, honesty, helping people, doing the right thing, yeah, is something that I'll never forget. You know, it's like like a Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Mm -hmm. It's like it's a wonderful life. I, I look at what I've done and what I'm going to continue to do in helping people. And it, it, it is so rewarding when you know that you've helped somebody and you get something as simple as a thank you. And that means a lot. Were your parents religious? 